Capacitors are one of the basic electronic components involved in basically every circuit ever created. And it doesn't help that they are really hard to understand when you're first starting out. I know personally when I was first starting out, it took me a really long time to get the grasp of them. They aren't exactly as simple as resistors. I mean, even the equation has calculus in it. You may have heard some people relate them to tiny batteries, and while that is true, it goes a lot deeper than that. It doesn't help that when AC gets involved, their behavior seems to change. So in this video, I'll show you how capacitors work, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll be able to use them in your own circuits. So without further ado, let's get into it. Many people get confused by the physics explanation of capacitors, so I'll try to keep it simple. Read a textbook if you really want to know more. We are more focused on the practical use cases anyways. Basically, a capacitor is made up of two electrically conductive plates separated by a non-conductive material. This non-conductive material is called the dielectric. Different dielectrics will cause a capacitor to have a higher or lower capacitance. Now, here comes the confusing part. When we apply a voltage to each plate, current will flow through the dielectric into the other plate and charge it up until the maximum voltage difference is reached. So, if I apply 5 volts to this capacitor, current will flow through it until the capacitor's plates have a 5 volt difference between them. It's not very intuitive, but the classic battery analogy works here. Applying our 5 volts will charge the capacitor up. Once it reaches the 5 volts, it cannot be charged any further, so current will stop throwing through it. You can't keep charging a full battery. That's why you can say that capacitors block DC. The charging process can be modeled by this equation. The current equals the capacitance multiplied by the change in voltage over the change in time. This equation may be hard to grasp visually, so let's walk through an example. Let's say that we have a fully discharged 1 microfarad capacitor. Let's use the equation to find out how long it would take to charge up. I set up an LM317 to give us a constant current of 1 milliamp. Watch my previous two videos on LM317s to learn how I did that. Anyways, that means that we can solve for voltage at a given time. To calculate how long it would take to get to, say, 5 volts, we can just plug it into the equation. If we arrange and solve for dt, we should get 5 milliseconds. Let's check this on the oscilloscope. And yes, the calculations are fairly accurate, with the real result being 5.6 milliseconds. Ideally, we should be getting a perfectly linear line. This is interesting. But, constant current isn't all that common for simpler power supplies in most circuits. So, let's change some things so that you can more easily recreate this at home. I will set my power supply to a constant 5 volts. Another thing that I will do is place a 1K resistor in series with the capacitor. We could use that same calculus equation to find out how long it would take to charge up, but there is an easier method. You can go through a mathematical process with the first equation and end up with the second equation, which is shown on screen. This second equation will give you the voltage of the capacitor at any given time. Anyways, using this new equation to solve for how long the charging process would be, we will find that it will never actually finish. If we take the limit of time as it approaches infinity, we will get to the answer that yes, it takes an infinite amount of time to fully charge the capacitor with this RT circuit that we have here. But that isn't exactly practical. We are engineers after all. It doesn't matter that it technically takes infinite time since we can get a value that is close enough in a relatively short time frame. For those RC networks, also known as resistor capacitor networks, there is a certain constant that you will find useful, and it is called the RC time constant. You can get this constant by multiplying the value of your capacitor and resistor together. This constant is equal to the amount of time it would take to charge the capacitor up to about 63% of its max voltage in series with this resistor. If we use that same resistor and capacitor pair from earlier, we will get a time constant of 1 millisecond. As a rule of thumb, it takes about 5 time constants to be close to fully charged. I've already told you about how capacitors will block DC from passing through them. So let me show you some proof of that. I've already shown you how an RC circuit's voltage will level out over time. The same thing happens with current, just in the opposite direction. On our oscilloscope, the current is the white line. Once the voltage has reached its maximum, no more current can flow through the capacitor. But the story goes a bit deeper. Really, capacitors are components that will resist a change in voltage. When we initially apply 5 volts to the capacitor, there is a sudden change in voltage. At first, there was a 0 volt drop, and now all of a sudden there's a 5 volt drop. So, the capacitor takes a while to charge up, and in effect, it resists the sudden change in voltage. It is the same in reverse. 
So if we take away the power supply and replace it with a short circuit, there is now a zero volt difference between each end. The capacitor does not like this, so it will take some time for it to dump its stored energy so that it returns to zero volts of charge. Hopefully that explanation has helped you to intuitively understand capacitors. Just remember that they will resist any change in voltage. And to change the voltage, it will either take or release current into the circuit, depending on which way the voltage is going. Rectifiers are a perfect example of this. If we take this AC signal from my function generator and pass it through a full bridge rectifier, we now have a DC voltage. This DC voltage is not yet usable because of how bumpy it is. A capacitor will fix this problem. When we reach the peak of the DC voltage, the capacitor charges up. Then, when the supply goes down again, the capacitor will maintain the voltage as it was at the peak. At the next peak, the capacitor will recharge and the whole process repeats. So, now you've seen what capacitors can do from a DC perspective. But things change a bit when AC gets involved. So far, we've been looking at capacitors from what we call the time domain. But there's another method which is called the frequency domain. When using the frequency domain, we don't look at things over time. Instead, we see how they react with a given AC frequency. And to use this frequency domain, I will have to introduce impedance and reactance. Basically, there are two types of reactants, capacitive and inductive. Since we are focusing on capacitors today, I'll leave inductors for another video. You can think of reactance as a sort of frequency-based resistance, and its unit is in ohms. For capacitors, here's the reactance equation. 1 over 2 pi Fc where F is the frequency in hertz, and C is the capacitance in farads. To demonstrate, let's quickly revisit our RC network. I've already shown you that using a DC signal will eventually level out and block any further current to the capacitor in the time domain. So, let's visit the frequency domain. Let's use our reactance equation here. Our frequency will be zero, since we are using DC. And if we take the limit, we will reach a reactance of near infinity. And as you might expect, Infinite resistance will mean that no current flows at all. Let's expand our RC network this time to use an AC sine wave running at 60 Hz. Let's begin with the time domain again. The first cycle is as we expect. The capacitor charges up and stops. Then when the sine wave goes low again, the capacitor has to suddenly deal with the change in voltage. So the capacitor discharges back into the AC supply. The result on the oscilloscope is simply an inverted view of what happened before. This process repeats itself forever. Let's do some math. We can use the reactance equation to get 2.6 kilo ohms. Now, this isn't a complete video on impedance, but to keep things accurate, we will have to mathematically combine the capacitive reactance and resistance. To do that, square each one and add them together. Then, take the result square root to get the impedance. Stay tuned for a full guide on impedances, by the way. Anyways, we will get a complete impedance of 2.8 kilo ohms at our 60 Hz frequencies. Anyways, we need to see if our result is accurate. Using this multimeter, which has true RMS capability, I get a voltage of 1.7 volts RMS on our sine wave. Dividing this 1.7 volts by the impedance, we get an RMS current of about 600 microamps, and the multimeter agrees with this result. Just for fun, let's increase the frequency to 1 kHz. Since the frequency changed, our results from last time are incorrect, so we'll have to rerun the equations. So I did rerun those equations from earlier, and I got an impedance of 1 kilo ohm at 1 kilohertz. Obviously, this is much lower than before. So the key takeaway here is that the higher the frequency, the lower the impedance for capacitors. The reason why these higher frequencies have a lower impedance than, say, a DC circuit is because they switch. Remember from the DC circuit where we have a massive current spike and then nothing? Well, a higher frequency means that we'll go into the current spike more often while we're switching directions. There is just one more thing that I want to point out with this circuit. Let's look more closely at the current and voltage on the oscilloscope. You'll notice that the current is always at its peak right before the voltage is at its peak. Or, in other words, the current leads the voltage. We can rationalize this with the time domain again. Again, when we first start charging the capacitor, there's a large current drop but very little voltage. Then, when the capacitor is fully charged, the current stops while the voltage is at its peak. This current leading is known as the capacitive phase shift. This phenomenon is not a good thing for power electronics, since it creates a larger and unnecessary power draw. You can counter this by using inductors, but more on all that in a future video. Okay, so that should just about cover it for capacitor theory.
So let's talk about capacitor selection. There are a lot of capacitor types and shapes, but here are the three main types that you will encounter. Ceramic, film, and electrolytic. Now I don't have any film capacitors with me, so I'll focus on the other two. Ceramic is not polarized, meaning that you can plug it in either way and it will work the same. Electrolytic, on the other hand, is polarized, so its orientation does matter. There's a negative and a positive side. So basically, you must always make sure that the positive side has a higher voltage than the negative side. You may be wondering why anybody would pick one type over another. Well, ceramic is non-polarized and has better performance than electrolytics. Its weakness is, though, that they are more expensive and have lower capacitances. Electrolytic, on the other hand, is worse performing, but has higher capacitances for a lower price. So you'll have to weigh these factors together to find out which capacitor you will need for your project. Here's one example circuit that you may find useful that involves the timing of capacitors. This circuit is known as the A-stable 555 timer oscillator. The capacitor and the two resistors are used for the timing of the circuit. The capacitor first gets charged from VCC through the resistors. Then when the threshold pin detects that the capacitor has reached two-thirds of the maximum voltage, it will enable the discharge pin. The discharge pin is then connected to ground and the capacitor discharges through it. Once the capacitor has discharged to one-third of the maximum voltage, the trigger pin will disable the discharge pin and the capacitor can recharge like it did in the beginning. Then the whole process repeats. The output is this nicely shaped square wave. And in case you are wondering, here's the waveform directly on the capacitor. You can see those charging and discharging cycles we were talking about earlier. Let's wrap things up by talking about decoupling capacitors. You will see these capacitors on basically every circuit, so it's important to know about them. Basically, they are capacitors that are placed between power and ground for each IC in a circuit. Their purpose is to filter out any unwanted AC noise. For example, if you're like me, you will have a cheap power supply that creates all kinds of noise. This is not good, especially for analog components like op amps. But remember from what I just taught you, AC signals are able to pass through a capacitor, but not DC signals. So we can place our capacitor near the IC, and most of those AC signals will be shorted straight to ground but our DC supply will pass over the capacitor and end up in an RC. As for the capacitors used, they're typically ceramic capacitors valued anywhere in the nanofarad range. I have a whole bag of those 100 nanofarad capacitors just for this purpose. Here is a comparison of that 555 timer circuit with and without the bypass capacitor. The power supply is also that noisy power supply that we just talked about. The first example I'll show you is with the decoupling capacitor. The supply is already noisy enough and you can see the effect of that on top of the square wave, but it can get much worse. Let's remove the decoupling capacitor. Now you can really see why bypass capacitors are so important. Not only is there more noise in general, there is also massive voltage spikes on the start of each square wave. If it wasn't for the 555 timer having such a large voltage range, it might have been destroyed by those voltage spikes. Hopefully now you have a good grasp on how capacitors work. They aren't exactly intuitive, so the best way you can learn more about them is to use them in your own circuits. Anyways, if you've enjoyed this video and learned something new, I'd really like to encourage you to check out my Buy Me A Coffee page. You see, these videos take a considerable amount of time and effort to make, and with your support, I can keep making more of them. Anyways, thanks for watching. Have a good one!